While driving home from rehearsal one day, this funk rock frontman was in a melancholy mood. Flashing back to his former drug-induced days, he saw himself strung out on a dirty mattress beneath an overpass, surrounded by junkies and gang members. It was a miracle that he was still alive. Suddenly, in the midst of all of his sorrow, he started singing. And for the rest of the ride, he freestyled a song that not only soothed his trauma, but it inspired a generation coping with theirs as well. So get ready, because we're taking it to the place you love. We're taking you all the way. It's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever written down the lyrics to a song by you know, starting and pausing a cassette because they weren't in the liner notes or in the little thing from the cassette tape, you're going to want to subscribe below right now. Nostalgia all the time. You're going to want to be a part of this community. Subscribe. Make sure to click the bell so that you never miss out on our story straight from the legends. Now, we also have a Patreon you're going to want to check out. There we have a brand new show that goes behind uh, the scenes of these live dates we've been doing. You can become an honorary producer and help us keep this a daily channel. So it's time for another edition of Number One in Our Hearts. This is where we break down a song that was so unbelievably great. It should have been number one on the Billboard Hot 100. But for various reasons, be it timing, promotion, or just indifference, the song missed. But years later, a lot of times it was bigger than the song that actually went to number one. Now, before checking himself into rehab in 1987, Chili Pepper singer Anthony Kiedis was a wreck. Struggling with a debilitating heroin addiction, he hadn't been clean since he was 11. His bandmate, guitarist Hillel Slavik, was also fighting his own battle with heroin. Rounding out the rest of the band at this time were also Michael Balzari, uh, a.k.a. Flea on bass, and there was Jack Irons on drums. They were a tight crew, three of them having been together since high school. So when Anthony Kiedis returned home to L.A., he felt like he had a new lease on life. He felt that things would only get better. This was when Flea introduced Anthony to actress Ione Sky. The two had met while filming the 1987 low-budget sci-fi film Stranded. For reference, this is the same Ione Sky who would play Diane Court in Cameron Crowe's 1989 film Say Anything, uh, becoming an 80s teen icon in that process. All my instincts. Kiedis and Sky immediately took a liking to each other and they soon moved in together. Anthony's time with Ione would be a patchwork of emotions, to say the least. In the beginning, he was sober. And in his words, he would say, we had lots of glorious days together. I'd wake up next to her in bed and think, she is such an angel, and I'm so in love with her. But Kiedis' sobriety was a short-lived. After a mere 50 days, Kiedis fell back into old habits. A couple of times a week, he'd borrow Ione's car, buy enough heroin to get high all night, and just disappear into the city. Sometimes he would be gone for days on end. Ione would try to convince Anthony to get high at home instead, but inevitably he was drawn back to what he called the, the downtown maze of ghetto dope hell. To facilitate his addiction, Kiedis partnered with a Mexican mafia dealer named Mario. Now, the two would often shoot up in a so-called safe zone beneath the freeway bridge, a place where the LAPD never patrolled. Since uh, the site was exclusive to Mexican gang members, uh, Anthony pretended to be Mario's brother-in-law to gain access. Hidden beneath that overpass in the middle of the city, Anthony spent countless hours lying on filthy mattresses, shooting up in the company of killers. Those moments became the crux of a demoralizing cycle. When he emerged from his strung out days, he'd go home, he'd cry, he'd apologize to Ione, get some TLC, and then sneak out for another speedballing binge. It must have been brutal for Ione, but she took it like Mother Teresa. Instead of cussing Kiedis out, she'd say, you have to eat, come and lie down on the couch. You're not going anywhere. Then she'd cook him some food and nurse him back to health. It's like being possessed, is what Anthony Kiedis said. There are periods you give up all of yourself and sacrifice everything to pursue using, even to the gates of insanity. And June 1988, Anthony was on his way home from his latest heroin holiday when he stopped to call Ione from a payphone. Uh, he launched into the, the usual apologetic routine. This time, however, something was different. His girlfriend was, was wailing and sobbing on the other end of the line. 
not over Kitas. She'd say, come home right now. She screamed, something terrible has happened. And when Anthony got home and out of his car, I only met him in the street. She was hysterical. Your friend, Hillel, he's dead. Uh, everything went numb. It couldn't be true. Hillel had been working hard to stay clean, but this was real. His friend and bandmate had relapsed and then overdosed. Kitas refused to accept the news, and by the next night, he was using again. There would be no scaring him straight. That Anthony would later say was a myth. Even when a close friend dies, you have the false sense of invincibility. You don't want to confront your own damage, so you just keep getting high to escape. Anthony would even skip out on Hillel's funeral, really to sidestep reality. After Hillel's death, the next blow came when drummer Jack Irons, he left the band. This is not where I want to be, is what he said. I don't want to be part of something where my friends are dying. The Red Hot Chili Peppers were falling apart before his very eyes. One dead guitarist, one departed drummer, and a frontman living in a drug-induced haze. It was right there where Kiedis realized he had to get it together. He and Flea had come too far to mess this up. So back to rehab he went, and you gotta give Anthony credit. He did the work. He made the change. He got clean. He even visited Hillel's grave and, and made peace with his friend's death. Sadly, though, Kiedis' sobriety had an adverse effect on his relationship with Ioni. He had been the, the needy, groveling screw-up, and she'd been his you know, saving angel. When that dynamic shifted, though, they never really found their footing. Their relationship started to spiral out of control. As we get further into this song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the frames that I wear every single day. So do you ever get headaches or fatigue from staring at a screen all day? Make sure to design a pair of Zennies with blue blocks. That's going to protect your eyes from harmful blue light. Go to zenny.com today, put in your prescription, and order yours. So Anthony Kiedis and Ioni Sky started to have a falling out. One day, Anthony told Ioni to take your stuff and get the hell out of here. After trying to convince him to change his mind, she finally said, you know what? I think I will. So she packed up and she left. And though Kiedis would beg for her to come back, she, she never did. Meanwhile, Anthony and Flea were sorting out a new lineup for the band. Early contenders included former Parliament guitarist Blackbird McKnight and former Dead Kennedys drummer D.H. Pellegro. Uh, but neither lasted long. After a lengthy list of auditions, Kiedis and Flea found some worthy replacements. The first was an 18-year-old guitar prodigy, John Frusciante a chili pepper fanatic who'd attended their concert for years, really. The second was Chad Smith, a massively talented drummer sporting a goofy GNR haircut and Venice Beach muscle men shorts. The Chili Peppers' reformation efforts would pay off quickly. Their first album together, 1989's Mother's Milk, became a surprise hit thanks to their single Higher Ground, a Stevie Wonder cover. Uh, MTV picked up its video, and they were well on their way to the success. Now, that success of Mother's Milk, that led to a label bidding war that happened in 1990. Now, the band signed with Warner Brothers and also hired producer Rick Rubin for their next album, Blood, Sugar, Sex, Magic. Things were finally, finally turning around for the band. They were just coming out of their most successful album yet. Chad and John were established as legit peppers, and uh, Anthony was clean. The future was looking extremely bright. So why did Kiedis feel so depressed? His breakup with Ioni and the death of Hillel had both left holes in his heart. But there was something else. He was beginning to feel like an outsider in his very own band. Ever since they'd formed the new lineup, Flea and John had grown closer, bonding in particular over their love of pot. John thought it enhanced his creativity and his songwriting skills. But Anthony wanted everyone to stay clean around him. And there was this sense of, here comes the narc, you know, whenever he'd enter the room. So one day, when Kiedis showed up to rehearsal, Flea and John were once again stoned. <laughs> and they had this, you know, let's ignore uh, Anthony vibe to them. This really affected Kiedis, and he felt a deep sadness over it. He could uh, tell from the way that John was looking at him that they weren't friends anymore. Not like they had been. 
On the drive home, Kitas thought about how he wasn't connecting with his friends or his family. He missed Hillel and he missed Ione, uh, that beautiful angel of a girl who gave him all of her love and uh, really all of her tenderness. But instead of embracing that, he had spent his days and his nights downtown with gangsters shooting speedballs under a bridge. That regret was so palpable. He'd thrown away so much of his life. These feelings of, of loss and loneliness, it just washed over him. And the only thing left that he could connect to was the city. There'd always been an unspoken bond between him and LA. He'd spent so much time wandering her streets and hiking Hollywood Hills that it became this, this sort of non-human entity to him. Walk through the hills, she knows who I am. He just felt like it was her, the city, who had watched over him when no one else could. So he just started singing. Sometimes I feel like I don't have a partner. Sometimes I feel like I don't have a partner. Sometimes I feel my only friend is the city I live in, the city of angels. City I live in, the city of angels. As Kitas continued his drive home, he started freestyling poetry and putting the words to a melody. He sang all the way down the freeway. And when he got home, you know, he grabbed his notebook and he wrote it all down. As he reflected on what he wrote, he thought about how sad it was. But he also realized that no matter how lonely he got, his life was infinitely better than it was two years earlier. There was no comparison. He never wanted to go back to how he felt when he was under that bridge two years before. The Chili Peppers were in pre-production for Blood Sugar Sex Magic when producer Rick Rubin discovered Under the Bridge. Uh, he was actually over at Anthony's house flipping through his notebook. What's this? Oh, that's just a poem, is what Anthony said. Man, that's dope. You should do something with that, is what Rick said. Uh, Anthony tried to explain that it wasn't really a Chili Peppers song. It wasn't really their material. It was slow. It was melodic. But it was too good for Rick to forget about. So at rehearsal a few days later, while the band was still waiting for Flea to show up, and Rick suggested that John and Chad check this song out. So Anthony tried to play it off. No, no, Flea's not even here. But his bandmates were really curious, so he sang it to them in three different keys, you know, not knowing what to do with it. When he was done, they walked over to their instruments and they started jamming, trying to figure out the song. The next day, John brought a mini Fender amp to Anthony's house. Okay, sing it again. How do you want it to sound? What do you want it to feel like? So again, Anthony came up with three or four different chord options and they worked through them until one of them really clicked. Stanley Kiedis said, in the end, it wasn't like I was writing any sort of pop song format. I just started writing about that bridge and all the things that occurred under the bridge. You know, but maybe that's exactly why this song is so meaningful. And when Kiedis wrote it, he wasn't trying to write a hit. He was just trying to cope with his pain. And I think for that very reason, uh, it had the innate potential to become a hit. It was, it was raw. It was authentic. It was a message that spoke to people. I mean, it captured the undivided attention of a generation. Maybe that's the best way to write a song, to just let it be what it is without trying to shoehorn it into a smash hit or some kind of status in that fashion. Lonely as I am, together we cry. The painful vulnerability in this song that came from Anthony's own tried experience, the struggle with addiction and desire to connect beyond that addiction, that's what makes this song one of the best of its time. Blood Sugar Sex Magic was the first time the Red Hot Chili Peppers were recorded with the same lineup for two records in a row. And according to Flea, the jamming, the writing, the planning, the making of Blood Sugar was one of the, the purest, uh, most fun, creative times in the entire history of the band. To record the album, Rick Rubin wanted to move the band out of the sterile studio environment. So he rented an old rundown mansion in Laurel Canyon. Reportedly, at one time, Harry Houdini, Jimi Hendrix, even the Beatles, all of them had stayed at this place. Its purpose was to be a sanctuary from the craziness of the City of Angels. There was no phone and minimal contact with the outside world. Though the band was initially reluctant, Rubin talked them into it. 
Now, during production, the band agreed to let Flea's brother-in-law document the creative process on film. When the album's recording was complete, the Chili Peppers released the film. It was called The Funky Monks. Okay, you guys played it great, but Flea, uh, split the difference there. Come in a little bit, okay? Said Anthony Kiedis about the experience. We lived in this house for two months and we never fought. We were just so happy to be making this record. And when we finished it, it was the greatest sense of accomplishment that we'll ever, that we'll probably ever know. We knew it was a watershed for us. Blood Sugar Sex Magic was released on September 24, 1991 to universal praise. In addition to Under the Bridge, it included 16 other tracks and four other singles. Give it away. Suck my kiss. Breaking the girl, and if you have to ask. To date, Blood Sugar has been certified platinum seven times over in the U.S., no doubt in large part due to the popularity of Under the Bridge. Its melody was always attractive enough to entice pop fans into the ranks, while simultaneously keeping the Chili Pepper faithful singing along as well. When Warners was considering releasing Under the Bridge as a single, uh, they wanted to see how the song was received in a live environment. So when the Peppers were about halfway through their U.S. tour, uh, some of the record company reps stopped in for a show uh, was somewhere in the Midwest. But for Kiedis, the song had been a hit or miss to perform live at that point. Sometimes he could get through it, sometimes he couldn't. Uh, that night, there was a huge audience there. So when it was time for Under the Bridge, John started those beautiful opening chords. But Anthony, you know, perhaps nervous, he missed his cue. He was mortified, you know, because he'd messed up in front of Warner's people. But suddenly, the entire audience bursts out into song, picking up at the spot where Anthony was supposed to come in. Everybody in that place knew all of the words. After the show, Anthony was apologetic, but the suit said, are you kidding me? When every single kid at the show sings a song, that's the next single. Pre-single status and Under the Bridge was already making an impact. While the Chili Peppers had already achieved success on the U.S. alternative charts with Higher Ground, that came in at number 11, Knock Me Down at number 6, and Show Me Your Soul went to number 10. They all failed to chart on the Hot 100 and, uh, you know, to capture that attention of mainstream audiences. Now, give it away, Blood Sugar, Sex, Magic's uh, Trailblazing single scored a number one on the alternative charts. But targeted toward the Pepper's hardcore fan base, it actually stalled at number 73 on the Billboard Hot 100. So in terms of pushing Kiedis and company into the mainstream spotlight, under the Bridge really was that song. It ascended all the way to number two on the Billboard Hot 100, and it also went to number two on the mainstream rock chart. Uh, it was kept at bay by Criss Cross Jump and uh, Black Crow's Remedy, respectively. The Black Crow's, that's one thing. Remedy is a great song. In terms of Jump by Criss Cross, I'll just say that Under the Bridge uh, has saved lives. Jump by Criss Cross has been the punchline to a few jokes, let's just say. Internationally, Under the Bridge came in at number 13 in the UK, went to number 11 in Germany, number three in Canada, number two in New Zealand, and it went to number one in the Netherlands, Belgium, and Australia. To date, it's their highest ranking Hot 100 hit. That's closest being uh, Danny California coming in at number six from 2006. But as if that wasn't enough, check this out. 
The Red Hot Chili Peppers put out four studio albums before Blood Sugar Sex Magic. Of these, Mother's Milk charted the highest and went to number 52, and the others weren't even close to that. Meanwhile, Blood Sugar Sex Magic rose to number three on the album charts, and since then, every studio album that they've released has dominated. One Hot Minute, that went to number four. Californication went to number three. By The Way went to number two. Stadium Arcadium went to number one. I'm With You went to number two. The Getaway went to number two. And recently, Unlimited went to number one. That, my friends, is the definition of sustained supremacy. Eight straight studio albums, all in the top four. And Under the Bridge, the breakthrough song that made it possible with over 100 million records sold worldwide. The Chili Peppers are one of the biggest selling bands ever and the most successful band in the history of alternative rock. Uh, they have the record for the most number one singles with 14 number one singles on the alternative charts. Uh, it's ironic that the song that kicked the band into high gear only came in at number six on that particular chart. Under the Bridge was featured in the movie Flight in 2012. It's also covered by uh, quite a few bands. All Saints took it to number one in the UK. That was back in 97. Tony Hadley, formerly of Spandau Ballet, covered it in 2000. PM Don in 2002. Taylor Dane in 2008. And Santana featuring Andy Vargas did it in 2010. Anthony Kiedis' personal song has really transcended any chart positions or pop culture reference. Under the Bridge, it's been a touchstone for my generation, Generation X, since its release. I was a singer in a band in another lifetime. You know, we played originals, but we slipped in a few covers every gig. Whenever we did Under the Bridge, it was automatic. I mean, everyone would freak out, and that's the thing. It's one of a few songs that no matter where you are in this world, if a band starts playing it, everybody, and I mean everybody in the audience, ends up singing every single word. It's not because they're drunk or because it's fun or it's humorous. Everybody sings it because it's a song of survival, a deeply compelling plea of desperation and suffering, but ultimately it's about hope and redemption. Anthony Kiedis' heart-sick vulnerability is living proof that no matter the trial we face, we can overcome. And that means more than any chart position. Leave us a comment about the Red Hot Chili Peppers and this beautiful song. What are your memories of Under the Bridge? What does this song mean to you? Let us know in the, in the comments below. Let's have a great discussion about it. Uh, if you like our videos, we do invite you to subscribe below to be a full-time part of our channel. Um, until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.